Farhan Grayaz, how are you? I'm pretty good. How about you, Farzan? Very good. You know, I remember the last time I saw you in 2014, I guess. And it seems like I'm meeting you a day later. You're exactly the same, man. What do you drink? <laughs> <laughs> I hope it's it was a truth because it's a very hard battle between losing weight, gaining uh -huh. it back up, uh, trying all those fat diets, and uh, and when you're short, you're mashallah a smart guy, but a guy like me who is a big foodie, and uh, and short, so you have it's a very fine line, at just two pizzas away, and you look effing pregnant so uh, not easy so whole, but i hope uh, i'll take it as a compliment i hope it's truth <laughs> no but, it is a compliment uh, you look very fresh mashallah thank you so much it means a lot so um, i remember the days uh, of you making amazing content uh, back in the university when we were doing bachelors and uh, those days you made a very interesting indie movie uh, that was on some interesting topic let's not mention that <laughs> <laughs> Thank but you for keeping the curtain. Day, it's been more than a decade <laughs> you're making amazing content, but the depth of the content is uh, waiting in a very positive way. So hats off for you. To you. And the last uh, regular interactions we had was in the master's class. And since then, mashallah, you've done your PhD. So huge, heartiest congratulations to you, man. Amazing job. Thank mashallah. you so much. Thank you. I, I never knew I could do it, but somehow... With divine no, help. No, no, no. <laughs> Amazing. Makes so, ladies problem. and gentlemen, I need to tell you this that Farhan was with me in the engineering management master's course, and he was so bright. I was I was totally impressed because he used to bring his original entrepreneurship ventures to the class when we were just babbling about what we can do ideally on our screens. So this guy has been motivated towards innovating and helping others to innovate from a very early age and you have stick to it ever since right uh that's the only good thing i've done i believe <laughs> that i've stuck to my path and uh, yes it's very much passion driven still a lot more to do but uh, yes that's the only good thing that i can take pride in i did not give up and still on the same direction so tell me, Farhan, tell me about your journey uh, uh, since we uh, last met. What have you been up to? Well, my journey had been very interesting, I would say, I would say but uh, not easy, especially when you don't have a mentor, because uh, the path I took uh, back then, entrepreneurship was not a buzzword. Not a lot of people knew about entrepreneurship, how, how that their alternative career paths existed back then. So I had to fight a lot of battles within my family uh, and a lot of peer pressure, I would say, because uh, as soon as I graduated, I got uh, good jobs, I would say. I, I never applied. I just applied initially with, I was going with the flow, then got jobs in the four good companies. But uh, unlike other of my fellows, uh, I used to be like, holy shit, what do I do now? I got the job. So in that, in, indirectly, it was like, uh, my dreams uh, of pursuing something what I love would be shattered. I, I, I'm not saying like with all due respect to my engineer friends, but somehow I figured out that maybe the FMCG, the plants, the whole uh, monotonous engineering life was not for me. I mean, I, I mean, no disrespect, but I'm just talking about myself. So it was like I was not very much inspired. Uh, so it was like, I don't know how to explain it, but I was not happy. And back then I was working on one of my own uh, ventures uh, with my class fellow who happened to be my co-founder. So we uh, launched Pakistan's first ever mobile messenger back then. And I'm talking about two, year 2008 and 2009. Uh, that was an amazing journey, I would say. We did, didn't, have, didn't have money. We didn't know what entrepreneurship or all those buzzwords, all those fancy jargon was. Uh, we didn't know how to write a single line of code. So it was all passion, craziness. We, we went cray cray and we thought we could make it uh, big. And we somewhat did make it big. Like uh, year 2008, uh, 2009 was my final years in uh, the bachelors and everyone was uh, working their socks off to 
manage the final year project. And uh, we were working day and night uh, on the coding marathons and all those things to pull the first version of our crappy messenger uh, on, up in the air online. So uh, it was called Max 99. So from that day till fast forward 2012, we from zero, we went to 4 million. We plateaued and we died. Why did we die? Because uh, I'm, we were amateurs, I would say. And other than that, smartphones came over. It screwed BlackBerry and Nokia. So we were kids in comparison. So what happened was we died. But in the end, we managed to monetize that. We made some really good money. But uh, in the end, it plateaued and died. Then I started a lot of my other ventures. Uh, one of the, maybe the ones you would remember, one of them was the anti clear computer class. Oh, yes. 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 And there were so many others, which was wrong. I don't regret it. But uh, what happened was I failed 15 of my own ventures. Uh, uh, I, not a good thing, not a bad thing, I would say, because I didn't have a mentor. I used to think like if Richard Branson can run 400 companies, can't Farhan run four companies? But that was wrong because I didn't have a mentor. I got the sequence wrong. You have to just take focus is the key. What I can learn from all of my little journey so far is that I should have focused and I should have uh, worked uh, with a laser focus on one thing, took it to that level. And after that, I should have hired other teams, project managers to work on the other ventures. But I got the sequence upside down. What happened? I started so many things at the same time. and at the end, all of them failed for one reason or another, but taught me a very valuable lesson, I would say. So it, it, it was just like that. Uh, very interesting because I launched, uh, you name it, from anti glare computer glasses to mobile messenger to I opened a paintball arena, jewelry business, women lifestyle magazine, even uh, kickboxing tournaments in the cage, just like UFC. So you name it, I tried to explore the gloves and all that. I, and I believe it gave me a multidisciplinary perspective uh, per se, but uh, still I would say yeah, I would have, if had I focused, things would have been much better. But everything happened for a reason because I believe because of so many of my own failures, the students I've been teaching since 2011 in uh, University of Central Punjab. Then I started my incubator in UET 2014. We'll come on to that in the later part of the conversation. So I saw that there are a lot of patterns which repeat for my own, in my own case, and a lot of other startups, uh, our students and our incubator startups, the mistakes we make are pretty much repetitive and have, have a pattern. So that's a good thing in, uh, in, the, in its own right, because this way we can minimize the failure and maybe have a better direction to the growth. So anything, I think so you can ask questions so that it flows. No, that is wonderful. I mean, I, I didn't know so much. Uh, I, I knew you had a few ventures and then you went into teaching and creating this incubation things, but I never knew you had so many ventures, man. I salute well, I your so. I shouldn't even have mentioned them because uh, now I'm not very uh, proud. I like the experience, but uh, had I taken them to certain level, then it would have been, I think, so at least uh, worthy of mentioning them. But just for the sake of telling you my journey, that's why I mentioned them. I'm, so, I'm not a very practical guy, Farhan. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a dreamer. So what I'm looking at, so am I. what you just told me, is living so many lives. And that's what excites that me. That You're I did. At so many different lives. Amazing. So one thing that I'm myself not very clear about, and perhaps many of the people listening would be interested in knowing as well, is what is an incubation center? I mean, these incubation centers that are suddenly starting to pop up at various places in Lahore and everywhere, what do they do? Well, incubation centers, I believe, just like I was mentioning that there are a lot of mistakes I made. So incubation centers do exactly the job of hand-holding and uh, Take a mentoring over the shoulder so that the startups don't repeat the mistakes which are very common. So the incubation is uh, taken from the analogy of uh, hatching the eggs and incubating them into the chicks. It's in the, so many hospitals of the newborns. So it's about the newborn, be it uh, 
human beings, be it startups, businesses. So incubation center, we have, a, we have mentors, we have program managers, and we have other experienced seasoned entrepreneurs from all around the industry from Pakistan and abroad, which help our aspiring entrepreneurs uh, in shortening the path to success. I'm not at all suggesting that we uh, imply that there are shortcuts, but it just uh, le lessens and flattens the learning curve. That's the main purpose behind that. And the other thing is about new venture creation. But, and I sincerely believe that UET, maybe I have a bias. So our university, University of Engineering and Technology, has amazing talent pool from all over Pakistan. So that talent pool actually uh, helps in uh, the venture creation of uh, so many amazing startups. So uh, if I tell you so far, uh, this incubation journey of Pakistan in Pakistani ecosystem was started by a respected, uh, very respectable Dr. Omar Saif <clears throat> He started Plan 9. And even before that, he started a SAP center of you know, incubation uh, in, uh, on Canal Road. Uh, NAST had it, uh, they say, before that, but main, uh, some, the incubation center with, uh, which came into the limelight was uh, Dr. Omar Saif Plan 9. And after that, uh, there were a few others, and all of them are doing a wonderful job. Because I believe it's not about competition, it's about nurturing Pakistan's startup ecosystem. That's what we all care about. Uh, it's not competition, and uh, even if there is for some bigger incubators, so it's a healthy one. So. Uh, what we are, have been doing in uh, our uh, our incubator is called TIC, Technology Incubation Center of UAT Lahore. So in 2014, I started that incubator. Uh, and I would say UAT has a lot of friction being a government institute, a lot of uh, inertia, but there were very few dynamic people and worth mentioning is uh, Director Kicks, Dr. Vakarsa. He was the only person who believed in my crazy ideas. There were a few other people whom I start, started it with, but uh, Dr. Vakar Saab is uh, worth mentioning, and uh, he's uh, leading the Premium Research Institute of Pakistan, Al Khwarizmi Institute of Computer Sciences. So we're doing some good stuff, which will I mention, but incubation was which we started back in the year 2014 with the main purpose of commercializing the research we had been doing in the university and creating new ventures among students. So since then, uh, we launched it at the end of 2014 or early 2015, been five years, I would say, uh, not very big numbers or impressive numbers uh, uh, in comparison with other incubators, but we have launched seven, incubated 75 plus startups. Collectively, we have uh, generated half a million dollar in revenue, all of the startups. And uh, collectively, we have created more than 250 small scale jobs with 50 of them being women. So, I mean, it's uh, very in a very lean way, but something to be, I would say, proud of, or at least we have uh, sown the seeds for the entrepreneurship and innovation. Uh, as there are some startups which are worth mentioning, as chemical engineering students, uh, Shayan and Arsalan, those guys uh, innovated and launched their own startup, which is, mashallah, I'd say, I would say one of the best startups in Pakistan. They launched, uh, those were chemical engineering students and uh, from our DICE, fellowship and DICE competition, which we conduct almost every year uh, by the DICE Foundation US. So in 2016, uh, those guys uh, uh, stood second in that competition and uh, their idea was very unique. The idea was uh, that they developed a nanotechnology based water filter membrane. Uh, it was a final year project, which would make the filthy water drinkable right away. So there was a similar startup in US called Life Straw. But what they had done wonderfully was they reduced the cost 10 times. So those guys, uh, idea was wonderful as it, as it sounds. But more, what was more awesome was those founders and especially Shyam. His energy, his passion, that was unbelievable. So mashallah, long story short, uh, they have... Uh, Till now, uh, these days, their company is valued at more than $150 million. Wow. And uh, that's not me saying, uh, ex-director of, of planning commission, um, uh, commission, Mr. Atha Osama Saab, 
he has said that and some other sources more than 150 million dollars you guys of uet uh, we're not taking the credit at all uh, it's all his sheer hard work but actually this is how the startup ecosystem accelerates such venture creation if you will create 100 startups there would be maybe one Cheyenne or Foxtrot. So it's like a funnel, it's like simple maths. So what we incubators should be doing uh, is encouraging more venture creation. We have had other so many very uh, interesting and amazing ventures, women-led startups making more than 10 to $12,000 a month, running a team of 10 people, we just uh, graduated a few months back uh, an indie game studio and those guys were mashallah making more than fifty thousand dollars a month and uh, i mean this is what we had been doing there were so many who were failing miserably and not making something at all but that's the part of the process so if you widen your funnel initially and have so many people go through this incubation uh, process and exposure to startups, then you just have the distill or the best essence of the startups in the form of not, I would say unicorns, but startups like Cheyenne's and so many others. So in, this is what incubation does, the venture creation. It's like a very moderated handheld venture creation so as to minimize the chances of failure and uh, maximize the chances of success. So I guess I gave perspective somewhat with some other figures and numbers. So I, I believe this is what incubation is and uh, maybe I'm biased. Uh, yes, there are so many flaws in our incubator and so many others, but I think so this is how even the Silicon Valley uh, grew. This is how even in other parts of the whole uh, startup ecosystem, international startup ecosystem, be it the South Indian ecosystem of Kerala in India, or be it the New York or London based startup ecosystem, incubators play a vital role in uh, encouraging the venture creation. Interesting. Okay, so you mentioned there were 50 employees that you created were women, right? Out of 250. Of, of 250 in all, and uh, 50 were of them were women, females. So, so I want to know a little about women in entrepreneurship uh, with respect to Pakistan. So uh, are they, uh, you, you tell me, I mean, uh, what I want to ask is the hurdles that they face and the opportunities that they have, because every problem is an opportunity, right? So the women's problems can be solved by women uh, entrepreneurs uh, like I saw this uh, woman taxi or rickshaw thing that was managed by women so is something like that happening a lot nowadays or uh, there are some women specific problems uh, mm -hmm. indeed which can be best solved by women no doubt about that but it's not not only just uh, uh, cornering or specifying it to women related problems only my uh, belief in this is, uh, uh, I'll, I'll quote another example that the startup ecosystem we are creating within the university, we have launched another amazing uh, freelancing hub. It's mainly run by uh, PITV, the Punjab in Board Information Technology Board, and uh, those are e-Rosgar Center. In that, we are creating freelancers uh, so that we can uh, train the uh, workforce in the gig economy who can actually uh, help and who can with a little bit of vocational training they can make their own uh, livelihood uh, now what i why i'm mentioning that i believe the school of thought which we belong to is that we want that even men should not be doing jobs they should be doing and running their own ventures but when we talk about women in pakistan i believe startups entrepreneurship and mainly freelancing this is very much women friendly in pakistan now let's not debate whether it's right or wrong but in our culture i'm talking about the mainstream there is a lot of women in pakistan are doing amazing job amazing job in the corporate se sector in the academic sector and you name it but and the mainstream what i'm talking about is in our cultures, uh, unfortunately, sometimes the women are not very much encouraged to go, go out of their homes and uh, work uh, in the overall labor force and contribute. With these kind, with the advent of these entrepreneurial opportunities and freelancing opportunities, uh, what happens is that uh, 
it very much encourages women and participation in the labor force because this way they can make a worthwhile impact while sitting in their own homes, which does not uh, affect them culturally. And even if a girl gets married and moves to her in-laws, it doesn't matter uh, if they are very moderate in their uh, school of thought or in their opinion or if they're very conservative it doesn't matter if a woman is working in her own home through her laptop so they don't care so what i'm trying to say is this business model of entrepreneurship and freelancing this vehicle is very much women friendly uh, so what happens is i believe if we continue moving like this and uh, minus these pandemic problems which are global i think so this way we can uh, and in the next five years, we would have a very healthy participation of women in our labor force. So this is one thing that, yes, women are solving women-specific problems very effectively because being men, we can say that we somewhat understand their problems superficially, but it's the women who emotionally and actually understand them. But other than that, uh, the entrepreneurship business model and vehicle of freelancing, it provides tremendous opportunities for the women participation in the labor force. So we are a big proponent of that in this regard as well. Great. Okay. Final question and then I'll, I'll let you go. What is social entrepreneurship and how is it different from this like more overwhelming tech and entrepreneurship that we keep looking at? Social entrepreneurship, uh, I, I don't consider myself an expert in the social entrepreneurial space, but uh, many people have different uh, points of views on that. Some people think that in social entrepreneurship, you ought not to make profit or you're not supposed to make money and stuff like that. But uh, another school of thought says, because the main thing, be it social entrepreneurship or normal entrepreneurship, I believe what I've learned so far, one of the very important aspects in any venture are two things. Number one is scale, how wide uh, you can spread it and scale. And the other is sustainability. So if your project is not sustainable, if it's not scalable, doesn't matter if it's social entrepreneurial or just entrepreneurial, totally for profit, it's not going to last. So in social entrepreneurship, sometimes your main objectives can be totally social to solve a societal problem and it might not be for profit but you have to make money so that you can sustain you have to pay the salaries and all that anyway but the main objective in the social entrepreneurial space is to solve the impending societal problems it can be of any nature uh, it can be the societal problems the other problems which we are facing in a way to propose the business model which can solve it in a very sustainable and scalable way. So there are a lot of, uh, sometimes we believe if you register an NGO, you become a social entrepreneurial thing. Uh, I believe that's not the case. You need to have a proper business model. You need to have a proper team working behind that. You need to definitely pay them. And, and you can only do that by making money uh, with all due respect to lots of organization, including some of our, of our own as well. We need to move out of that grant mindset and of that donor mindset. If a venture, uh, be it any venture, and especially social entrepreneurial venture, it has to be sustainable it's in its own right. And that means the business model has to be designed in such a way so as to, to make it cash flow positive, so as to give it more scale and sustainability. And uh, again, coming back to the point, the, it should be designed so as to solve the societal problems and i believe there is no better vehicle than uh, innovation and entrepreneurship to solve the social problems of the society so i hope i made myself clear if not you can ask more question and dig deeper i think yeah i think then it would sometimes it wouldn't be easy to distinct the two because uh, for example, the project of Cheyenne you talked about, it can easily become a social ent entrepreneurship yes. project if it is extended to the society. So yeah, I understand it now. It's, it's, it's different, but it's not that different. Uh, yeah, there's a very fine line, yeah. but I think so that there are some other experts who can answer it well. So we are mainly catering for the startups, which are of social nature as well, but 
other than that as well. We are working a lot on the uh, research uh, commercialization as well. And uh, you being the, I'll try to flip the table if it's allowed, uh, you being the researcher in mashallah, you just did your PhD. So we are working a lot on the research commercialization part and we have uh, very respectfully a little complaint, not to you guys, generally in Pakistan, what I've seen is a lot of research we do is without the customer discovery and the market research part. So how are the things in US and how do you see that? Because I'm talking about academic entrepreneurship, uh, like uh, I'm sure you have been researching on wonderful topics and if they were to be commercialized, so what route should be taken and generally, what's your take on the customer discovery and market research part before carrying out the research? What do you think? Okay, research here in the US, I feel is different in a way that it's directly linked with the industry. So it's directly solving most of the times the industry problems. So that application is right there, right afterwards. And uh, that, that makes it so, so attractive to work on these projects as compared to back in Pakistan, though there are some projects that require more patience. Again, I, I consider myself as a person of a different temporal mindset. I want outputs like this, but there are some great people who can foresee the benefits in decades and still be excited about it. I'm not that person. So I, I feel like it should be direct implementation with everything, which is wrong because there are some aspects that you cannot cater for right away. But again, all the research or perhaps most of the research here is feeding the industry. Industry is supporting you financially and you're solving their problems. If that model can somehow be introduced and gradually implemented in Pakistan, that would change the complete ecosystem of research. 100% exactly my point. So I'm really glad it's happening like that in the US. Uh, uh, so I visited some of the universities in the US and I found exactly the same thing. But unfortunately in Pakistan at large, there are some amazing people doing amazing work, but at large, it's not the case. And it's generally the publish or perish philosophy yep. or uh, with due respect, uh, the grant mindset. I know a lot of people would hate me for that, but that's the bitter truth. But So if we can just sort it out, I believe uh, uh, things would be way better than they are right now. True. I um, fortunately had the chance to explore my own research and I took it in a direction where I can somehow do something for industry back home. But a lot of people don't have that choice back home and they just work on whatever is presented to them on the plate. So I don't blame all the students for this. It's perhaps the policy. It has to start from the top. Uh, you need to exactly it's a top yeah. down approach so hec and ignite another organization has to play the, uh, their role yeah. as well yeah. so i hope one day inshallah we'll solve then things would be way better so uh, that's pretty much it if you want to ask some other questions no farhan thank you so much i hope there are more farhans in pakistan so that we can no, 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 i'm humble truly humble <laughs> uh, thanks very much for having me. It means a lot. Yeah. And uh, definitely we need to connect more often other than this Zoom meeting. Definitely. So let's do that. So I'll, I'll stay in touch and perhaps we'll do this again with some, some focused subject next time. So we'd love to. We're love love to. Thank you so much. Thank you for inspiring. Thank you for giving me your time and I'll see you. Thank you very much. Wonderful uh, have, uh, having the conversation. So inshallah, some other day. Let's keep in touch with the office. Bye-bye. Have a wonderful evening.